The, uh, that large image of me recording on the in progress it's not what I want to see first thing in the morning um, at any rate uh, good morning everybody um, this uh, this morning we continue our fiscal year 23 24 budget deliberations uh, once again as we do at all of these we'll start by going around the table and just introducing ourselves today of course public safety is on the agenda I'm Ted Wheeler I'm the mayor I'm sorry no, your name is actually Carmen, isn't it? <laughs> I'm here all day, folks. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> uh, apologize about that, folks. Commissioner Carmen Rubio. Uh, Commissioner Mangus Maps. Commissioner Dan Ryan. Go ahead, Tim. Tim Grew, Budget Director. Peter Holzman, Economist. Jeff Selby, Office of Equity and Human Rights. Chad Ahmed, Director of Emergency Management. Bob Causey, Director, Bureau of Emergency Communications. Sarah Boone, Fire Chief, Portland Fire and Rescue. Kathy Warner, Portland Fire and Rescue. Aaron Johnson, Portland Fire and Rescue. No, okay. Ryan Gillespie, Division Chief, Portland Fire and Rescue. Oh, great, yeah, go, go for it. Annette, why don't you introduce yourself? You're online there. Thank you. Uh, Annette Matson, Citizens Budget Advisory Committee. Okay, great. And uh, just oh, Renee, how, how y'all doing? Introduce yourself, please. Commissioner Gonzalez, awesome. Commissioner of Public Safety. Terrific. All right. So, uh, just as a reminder, this year's budget work sessions are organized by service area, administration, public safety, public works, culture and livability, and community and economic development. Today, we're going to dive into the service area of public safety, to which Commissioner Gonzalez is the commissioner in charge. Before I hand this off, I want to just uh, remind people that we have three remaining sessions after this one. March 16th, we'll focus on public works. March 20th, we'll focus on culture and livability. March 23rd, we'll focus on community and economic development. There's also three community budget listening sessions taking place. The first one, believe it or not, is next Tuesday, March 21st from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. Then Monday, April 10th from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. And Saturday, April 15th from 10 a.m. to 12 a.m. Both the work sessions and the budget listening sessions are viewable on the City of Portland YouTube page. Community members can sign up to speak at the budget listening sessions by visiting the City Budget Office website at www.portlandoregon.gov forward slash CBO. Again, that's www.portlandoregon.gov forward slash CBO. Click on the fiscal year 23-24 budget events tab to find the sign up links. With that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Gonzalez to kick off the session. Good morning. Good morning, all. It is my pleasure to begin our conversation on the fiscal budget for 23-24 in the Public Safety Bureaus. Today you're going to hear from our public safety experts who will take you talk to you about our fire department, our 911 system, and our city's emergency planning capabilities. I'm talking about Portland Fire and Rescue, the Bureau of Emergency Communication, and the Bureau of Emergency Management. Aaron, could you flip a couple there? 
So as a part of this, we'll begin to unpack emergency response metrics, staffing questions, and a lot about the resilience and capacity in these bureaus. I also want to frame up the conversation and our responsibility here in a very simple way. With this year's budget, it's obviously going to be tricky uh, path to navigate. I hope that together with these first responders, my office, my office can make an aggressive case for why we must protect our core staffing and services. Because the bottom line is that stable funding and staffing in these public safety bureaus translates directly into our city's core livability. And of course, it helps save lives. But when there is an immediate emergency and we engage in uh, disaster planning or in an immediate, immediate emergency. So one last piece, can you flip through one more, Aaron, there? So my, our bureaus are sort of the centerpiece of this in the public safety apparatus. And so we have Portland Fire, uh, we have BOAC and PBEM. When we're talking about BOAC, and we're gonna get into the details here in Portland Fire, we're very, very much focused on the speed and quality of response. BOAC is really about resiliency and planning for surge capacity when we have a crisis at a citywide or regional uh, level. So we'll, when we talk about metrics, when we talk about investments, let's th keep that in mind. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Chief Sarah. Thank you, Commissioner Gonzalez, Mayor Wheeler, Commissioners. For the record, my name is Sarah Boone, Fire Chief for the City of Portland. Thank you for the opportunity to present our Bureau's budget overview, priorities, and discuss our needs with you today. I recognize the gra gravity of this year's budgetary challenges with the one-time funding cliff, the pension resources, expanding programs to meet our social crisis, and the reality that a lot of energy and resources will be diverted to build the new city structure in 2025. I realize the city faces difficult decisions during this budget process, and this, or during the budget process, and this year is no exception. I'd like to set the tone in which we come before you as one component within a public safety system where our shared responsibilities and core priorities are critical to the health and wellness of a population, the livability and survivability of our communities, and serve as the last safety net when all other systems have failed. We come before you to share our Bureau's story and ask for your support to build back Portland Fire and Rescue to a high-functioning organization that can fulfill the public's expectations and our mandates to perform critical core services. We will highlight throughout our presentation the following priority areas. Our authorized staffing levels <clears throat> are insufficient to manage our workload and system of response. We are facing unprecedented retirements in the forecast and will need to increase our training capacity now to meet these demands. Houseless calls constitute roughly 17% of our call volume. We need to be better equipped and trained to handle the increased complexities of houseless response. We are requesting the restoration of FIRE's four rapid response vehicles in fiscal year 23-24, as they are responsible for approximately 10% of the Bureau's call load in areas of the city with some of the highest service demand. We need to ensure the safety and well-being of our employees working at our facilities and focus city geo bond issuance on the replacement of our failing and substandard logistics, fire marshal's office, and training facilities. Next slide, please. With that said, I wanna take our focus back uh, to the core services the public expects. Portland Fire and Rescue provides critical services to our city and our region. We are the largest urban fire, rescue, and emergency services provider in the state of Oregon. 
As an all-hazard emergency response agency, Portland Fire and Rescue provides the public with critical safety services, 24-7 fire, medical, and other emergency incident responses, fire prevention services, plans review, code enforcement, arson investigations, and fire life safety, public education, and outreach. Efficient training, apparatus maintenance, technology, financial, and other functions are tightly integrated into all bureau operations and provide mission critical support to frontline workers providing essential services to our community. We need the staff and organizational structure to continue to operate in the most hazardous environment we have faced in modern history, as well as meet today's service level demands and address system constraints that are nearing critical failure within the broader emergency response system. We are a dynamic organization that must continue to evolve to meet the city and public's expectations while preserving and protecting critical infrastructure. We cannot expect successful outcomes with staffing levels that are static with those of 20 years ago, while the city and our service population has increased more than 20% in that same time frame. Portland Fire and Rescue's operational performance must consider, as I've said before, three critical areas when it comes to our overall effectiveness. It is the resource availability that we have and the reliability, which is the degree to which our resources are ready and available to respond on a moment's notice. It is our capability that comes to the heart and soul of our training. How well are we prepared and trained for what we face today and into the future? And then the operational effectiveness, which really is the combination of our reliability, availability, and how we operate in a moment's notice under extreme circumstances to mitigate the hazard and reduce loss of life, threat to property, and the environment. Next slide, please. I would like to highlight our accomplishments and priority investments in the in 23-24 budget. And thank you to council for some of the one-time funds. It is critical that we continue to invest in our people as 90% of the Bureau's budget is dedicated to our personnel. Over the course of years, the Bureau has divested in training and professional staff in order to support frontline, cut, frontline services as cuts eroded our budget. We are looking to restore critical training bandwidth as every bureau program requires the bureau to have high functioning, a high functioning training program. We are evaluating the options to continue uh, dedicated EAP support to our members beyond the one time funded position expiration on June 30th, 2023. Additionally, we are looking at partnering with the Community Safety Division in ways that can provide restoration of support services to the Bureau that have been severely reduced over recent years. We are also focused on improving our employee workplace culture and through investments in the professional standards and equity programs we established in August of 2022, since that time, with, at least with the professional standards, the number of investigations closed has increased substantially. And the average time from investigations that were open to closing has decreased from 430 days down to 41. That is the good news. The not so good news is that the one-time funding for the programs run out at the end of 20, fiscal year 23-24. Additionally, our equity program has developed the Bureau's racial equity plan and has launched the Bureau's equity leadership training program in the current fiscal year and will amplify the program efforts in fiscal year 23-24.
as a standard practice in public safety fields. We provide mutual aid part, uh, to partner jurisdictions in times of needs, such as the 2020 wildfires across the state. We will in turn receive mutual aid during our times of need. These relationships are force multipliers and require cultivation and effort. Therefore, we are in the process of hiring the city's wildland fire strategic planning coordinator who will work across the city bureaus to align our policy and planning, work to prepare for eventual wildfires within and adjacent to the Portland city boundaries. This position will also coordinate regionally and at the state level in policy and planning efforts. The coordinator is a great first step, but are looking to build our resilience as a city with adding a new program under the wildland coordinator that can perform wildfire fuels mitigation and reduction work on city property. We have been talking with our partner city bureaus to identify the need and scope of the work. This new program will reduce our collective liability, risk and harm from future fire events. This preemptive approach will become critical in the face of greater risks due to climate change. We will share more about our priorities and challenges in the following slides. And now I will turn it over to our business director, Kezia Warner. Thanks, Chief. Oh, am I not on? Thanks, Chief. I'm Kezia Warner for the record, business director for Portland Fire and Rescue. And I'm going to try to slow down my natural way of talking pretty fast, so <laughs> bear with me. Uh, the Fire Bureau's fiscal year 23-24 requested budget totals more than $172 million, inclusive of all funds. This slide you see reflects the Bureau's resources for next fiscal year with 82% of the budget coming from the general fund. Also notable is the 17% of resources derived from our interagency agreement with Fire Police Disability and Retirement. I'm sorry, Fire Bureau incurs PERS expenses for our members and FPDNR reimburses the Bureau for the sworn members' pension costs. Approximately 4% of the Bureau's resources are program revenues, primarily from our permitting and inspection activities in our prevention division. Additionally, the Bureau receives grant funding, which varies annually and is budgeted at 4% of total resources in the next fiscal year. Thank you, Aaron. This slide is another way to look at the Bureau's resources as a trend line. One thing to point out in this slide is that all things being equal, we would expect to see it increase year over year of resources inflating, but instead you see that 23-24 decreases from our current year levels. That is due to the reduction of the 2.7 million representing the cut of our rapid response vehicle funding next year. This had been directed by council in a budget action two years ago. The 2.7 million funds 24 firefighters, and if not restored in our budget, the impacts will be eight fewer on-duty firefighters daily and a reduction in our response capabilities citywide. Our RVs will be discussed in a later slide in the presentation. We are an organization of more than 825 employees and the lion's share of our expenditures, 92% to be precise, cover personnel costs which grow commensurately with COLA, merit, union contract financial impacts and other inflationary costs. Comparing fiscal year 1819 and next fiscal year, our personnel costs comprised 85% of the total bureau expenditures in fiscal year 1819 compared to the 92% projected in fiscal year 23-24. This indicates a structural deficit in that an increasing percentage of our budget is funding personnel with decreasing resources than available to cover non-personnel costs such as materials and services and capital expenses. This slide is related to the expiring one-time resources which the chief has alluded to already. We have multiple programs funded with limited duration funding. 
The Employee Assistance Program, which provides critical services to our members, is funded with one-time resources that will expire at the end of this fiscal year. The Professional Standards Program, which is setting up systems of accountability in the Bureau and making significant progress closing the backlog of investigations, is funded with two years of one-time resources and expires at the end of fiscal year 23-24. The Community Health Assess and Treat Program, also known as CHAT, is grant funded by a healthcare system partnership that is negotiated annually. The current agreement supports 31 positions and current funding will run through September 2023. And lastly, the Portland, sorry about that, the Portland Street Response Program has 24 positions that are funded with ARPA dollars. However, the program is working to qualify for Medicaid funding under the CAHOOTS Act in the next fiscal year, which is expected to provide some funding stability. Next slide, thank you. As noted before, the Fire Bureau's primary funding streams are general fund resources and prevention program revenues, augmented with uncertain and uneven funding of grant resources, wildfire deployment reimbursement, and general obligation bond resources for capital projects. We also have unfunded liabilities stemming from insufficient funding streams and cost drivers. Liabilities related to Bureau expenditures include projected retirements and insufficient number of sworn staff, which contribute to overtime costs. Additionally, materials and services are increasing at a rate higher than that which our budget is inflated. The Bureau's capital investments are underfunded and therefore we look to a GEO bond issuance roughly every 10 years to fund major capital expenditures including fire, funding fire trucks and engines, capital and equipment, and the pressing need to replace our aged and failing facilities of logistics prevention and training facilities. The Bureau's capital needs exceed $224 million over the five-year forecast, and the Bureau has only 12% of committed funding identified, which is carved out from the Bureau's annual general fund allocation. FIRE has relied, as mentioned, on general obligation bond resources to fund major capital expenditures on roughly a 10-year cycle. The last bondage issuance was in 2010, and we are overdue to seek another. We look to Council for support and the potential to partner with other City Bureaus, some of them at this table, to work together on a strategic geo bond effort at the soonest opportunity. This graphic shows the Bureau's staff broken out by sworn and non-sworn or civilian employees. Civilian employees have traditionally comprised roughly 9% of our total employee number, which is an extremely low ratio of support staff to line staff. The numbers of sworn members have remained static over the five-year period. The number of civilian employees increase in the current fiscal year and continue to ramp up in 23-24. This increase is due to the growth of the Community Health Division, which is comprised primarily of non-sworn employees, a large portion of whom are funded by limited duration resources. The Bureau's overtime costs continue to rise, as does the Bureau's overall personnel costs year over year. The gray bar reflects our personnel costs projections for the current fiscal year, and the increase this year is a bit more steep due to the growth in staffing of the Community Health Division programs, in addition to financial impacts of the Portland Firefighters Association contract. The PFFA contract terms have included increased leave hours and decreased work hours starting in mid-2022. Recognizing the staffing gaps and the reliance upon overtime that the contract impacts created, we identified the need for additional firefighter positions in fall of 2022. However, at that time, we're directed to address this need in the fiscal year 23-24 budget process, which we, were, which we are doing. We will be seeking council authorization to create the 13 firefighter positions which will allow us to staff firefighters on straight time rather than overtime to fill shifts. This will enable us to achieve a healthier, healthier level of overtime for our organization and for our employees. 
The Bureau is looking at significant number of potential retirements in the current calendar, in the current year, current calendar year and next fiscal year, with almost 100 members retirement eligible before December 31st of 2023. Over the five-year forecast, nearly 40% of our sworn members will be retirement eligible. If even half of these employees retire, it has the potential to create a crisis unless we staff appropriately to ramp up hiring and training activity. It takes roughly 12 months from firefighter recruitment to being deployed on the line. Therefore, we're looking to council to support an overhiring firefighters so new recruits can enter the training pipeline and be ready to fill the future vacancies projected to occur in December of 2023 and June of 2024. This slide is another way to look at our firefighter staffing and hiring plan for 23-24. We have 439 firefighter positions, all of which will be filled on July 1st of 2023. We have 119 potential retirement vacancies in 23-24, which we anticipate will actually bear out to be closer in the range of 40. To meet the potential vacancies created by the retirements and other attrition, we would need 45 recruits hired in fiscal year 23-24. We are looking for council authorization to create the aforementioned 13 firefighter positions needed to address the union contract impacts. Additionally, we're looking for council support to over hire fire, firefighters into limited term positions as a short term measure to address the upcoming retirement wave. We will bring forward a strategy that enables us to hire and train up firefighters to fill the projected vacant positions. And with that, I turn this over to Chief of Emergency Operations, Ryan Gillespie. Thank you, Kezia. Uh, good morning, my name is Ryan Gillespie, Division Chief of Emergency Operations for Portland Fire and Rescue. Uh, this, this next slide speaks to the RRVs. This current fiscal year, we have funding to support our four RRVs, Rapid Response Vehicles, also known as rescues. However, at this point, due to a council decision in fiscal year 21-22, the RRVs have been cut from our next year's budget. The majority of the calls the rescues respond to are medical in nature, including high and low acuity medical calls. However, they do respond to many other call types when they are the closest response resource or other resources are unavailable. The importance of the RRVs to the Bureau and the community is that they provide call response in the areas of the city that experience the highest call volume and which has the greatest station spacing. The rescues currently respond to approximately 10% of all calls dispatched to Portland Fire and Rescue. The call response times in the areas of the city where the rescues are deployed will be significantly higher than in other areas of the city if the funding for these resources is not restored. In addition, the call volume would be redistributed to East Portland fire resources, which are already running above capacity. A priority for Portland Fire is ensuring equity and service delivery. And with the RVs as part of the Bureau's response model, we are able to provide equity of service to the residents of East Portland. Aaron, can we go to the next slide? This slide shows PFNR's call load attributed to response to the houseless community. Overall, houseless-related call volume continues to increase for Portland Fire and Rescue and is currently constituting more than 17% of all Bureau incidents. The three categories identified specifically in this slide are fire, rescue and EMS, and other calls. Fire, rescue, EMS calls have remained fairly static for the three years shown. However, we do see a significant increase in the consolidated category of other, which combines many different subcategories. Almost half of the calls within the other category are unauthorized burning or warming and cooking fires. We have seen a triple fold increase in these call types over this time frame. Calls within the houseless community are often very complex and difficult due to conditions of the living areas and violence and intimidation experienced by the, Port experienced by the Portland Fire and Rescue crews. Extreme mental health and addiction issues, which are unfortunately prevalent in this community, adds to the very challenging environment into which our PFNR folks respond. 
Thank you, and with that, I'll pass it back to Chief Boone. Thank you, Ryan. So, we have presented today with, we have presented, my apologies, we have presented you today with information about our financial condition and our Bureau's resource needs. We hope that from today's discussion, you better understand, sorry, my apologies, we all understand that we have uh, the following unfunded liabilities, staff and training costs, capital construction expenses, and generally speaking, we are under-resourced to perform the nuanced and complex work that providing services within the city of Portland requires. We greatly appreciate your time and attention and look forward to addressing these challenges together. Thank you, excellent presentation. And colleagues, I, I know this presentation probably raised many, 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 many questions, and we're not gonna get to all of them today, um, but it was excellent and concise presentation. At this point, we'll, we'll take questions from people. I might tee off, or did you have some? Just a very yeah, quick Please question. go ahead. Go for it. Please. Um, Uh, sure, for the other the other calls. So these are the calls. This is how these types are coded with the situation found. So when the fire crews respond and arrive, whether it's coded as a fire, an EMS call, within the other, uh, the, the stat that I mentioned is that almost half of those are uh, within the houses community are unauthorized burning calls, which is the cooking and warming fires, um, which the crews are frequently responding on. And we can get you a breakdown of the entire spectrum of what those other other calls are so you can see that that mix sure uh, chief Ryan thank you for that comprehensive report so I want to hone in on RRVs for a bit here so 10% of call volume um, when you walk through this council in August 30th uh, work session we talked a lot about response time metrics and national standards uh, for fire departments can you just reiterate um, how some of those goals are set. So for example, how quickly does a fire double in size? Um, when do we see uh, essentially uh, a person beyond resuscitation when we're talking CPR and other uh, remediation? Um, just walk us through high level uh, what those typical uh, metrics are. Sure, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't have the exact, I wanna make sure I give you the exact number so I can, we can get those to you exactly, good. but uh, conceptually, what our goal for response time is, is five minutes and 20 seconds to, to get there and, and to make a difference. We are well above that. We've, with it, we've been within the seven to eight minute time range over the last few years. Um, how we make a difference is through that response time and then also the, the scope of, of who we send or what we send, so the number of personnel that respond. So every incident requires a different, uh, a, a different type of response or a different response force. Um, but when you boil it all down, the emergencies that we go on are, uh, are timely and we need to get there quickly. The impact of the RVs and the rescues and, and what they've done over the years and what they continue to do is allow us to keep that response time relatively low. It is still not where we wanna be um, based off, off NFPA uh, National Fire Protection Standards. We would like to reduce that. But what the RVs have done is enabled, enabled us to uh, keep more companies in service, essentially, and, and get to the fires, to the emergencies uh, quicker to make that difference. Got it, and just as a reminder, our RVs are primarily deployed in East Portland? Yes, that's correct, yep, and one of them is deployed at Station 23 um, in Southeast Portland and is the only uh, response resource that is responding out of that station right now. Okay, um, just one other follow-up question, I'll turn it over to my colleagues. So. Uh, you highlighted at a high level the impact of last year's collective bargaining agreement. I just want to get into some of those details and just so that my fellow council uh, can understand the impacts that had. So is it fair to say, and I, I don't know if Chief, you want to answer this or who on your team, but is it fair to say that in that collective bargaining agreement, the city traded lower, essentially lower pay for lower hours? And I, now I recognize there's bigger parts to, it's a, it's a big contract, there's many pieces, but um, that the goal was, you know, you, you, one of the big trade-offs in, in negotiating fire contracts is you either pay for more hours or you, 
you know, you, you pay more on hours or you um, decrease the work week. Uh, is that a fair is that a fair summary of what happened in that last year? Yes, uh, Commissioner. But I think it's also where we had been in negotiations uh, and uh, just prior to the pandemic. So again, this is something that you know nobody had seen uh, throughout the world uh, that came here. And so we also had last minute concessions um, prior to actually uh, ratifying the contract. And so we delayed a little bit um, and wanted to make sure that the city was in a position or what position that would be when we, when we finally um, had some concessions. And so I think the critical point of this was we didn't know what we were facing. We were heading into an economic cliff. And one of the things um, that we negotiated that we thought <coughs> would be in the best interest is we would uh, defer maintenance and labor would work additional hours. And so um, they worked in additional hours to help through the pandemic, through civil unrest, through all these events that we couldn't predict. And then in agreement uh, in the last uh, year of the contract, uh, reduce the hours in the work week, and that is the gap that we need to cover today. I'm going to try and keep it simple for my colleagues because this is a complicated sort of math, but we we still have this same number of FTEs for every shift that's required. So when we decrease the work week for fire, there's just a structural staffing gap that was created, and that's the 13 FTEs we're talking about. This is part of the reason for the explosion in overtime uh, this year in Portland Fire. Um, and it's, uh, there are, we're making really tough choices. We're not spending money on maintenance on public safety apparatus in order to pay for that overtime to keep Portland Fire on budget. So this is not a sustainable path. It is not sustainable in terms of impact on our apparatus, uh, nor on our people. And um, would leave it that for your other questions. Thank yeah. you. Uh, can I go to Annette? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have a couple questions. Um, Portland Street response was mentioned, and I guess just as a member of the public, my impression from media coverage was that was being paid for by the police bureaus. Could you please clarify if that's coming from <laughs> fire? Is that coming from Portland police or was it a brand new allocation of funding in a new budget? I'll take that question. Um, the funding for Portland street response is in the fire bureaus budget. Okay. And then, um, like most government budgets I've seen, the majority of your costs are personnel. Um, where are you in your um, in your collective bargaining cycle? We're currently um, negotiating the contract um, that would be going in place on July 1. So we're mm -hmm. in that process right now. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, Michelle. Ryan, thank you. You mentioned... Good morning, first of all, and thank you for your service to our city and all your employees. It's good to see you. You said the last bond was 2010. And how frequently have we done capital bonds in the past? It's been about 10 years spacing. So every So there's decade. usually about a 10 year spacing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that mm -hmm. makes sense. Um, let's see. It was a, it's a surprise when you look at the graph on the amount of retirees because it really does spike this year. What would um, be some of the factors in why this year you're projecting such a high amount compared to the future? Or do you think that in 2027 suddenly we could be surprised? In other words, was this projected a few years ago? I think that it's been something that has been on the radar. Um, and we now realize with people that were retirement eligible for the past seven years that haven't retired, it just keeps moving people forward in the retirement forecast, so it's sort of pent up at this point. Um, but we do have a large number of potential retirees that are eligible on the dates in the next five-year forecast as well. I think I'm going to turn it over to either Chief mm -hmm. Gillespie or Chief Boone to talk about the reasons why, because there were major hiring classes that happened okay. that now are people are retirement eligible on those same dates, you know, going forward into the forecast. But I'll turn it over to... 
Yeah, I think just quickly to add on to that, the hiring does go in, in cycles and you see the workforce go through that. We are, I, well, along with police, I guess, are somewhat unique in that we maintain a workforce for 25 to 30 years and so it's a, a longer cycle. Um, so 25 to 30 years ago, there, there was a large number of people that were hired continuously mm -hmm. and now we, we're seeing that 25 years later. We can somewhat predict the months when, when folks will retire based off the, the FPD and our pension system so we can forecast within a year potentially when people could go but not always how many. Um, we would know that the total number that are eligible um, but it is a, a, a personal decision for folks on when they're actually going to, um, going to uh, retire from service. And I assume most of them are sworn. Yes. So that okay. that is the yeah that's the group that we're talking about um, is is the sworn firefighters. Can I can I add something real quick before we move on? I know you have another question, but I just yep, wanted just to say more. about the the uh, FPDNR retirement dates because this is important for those that don't know this. There are months of the years in which are financially advantageous for our police and fire members to retire because it affects their pensions favorably. So we know that on those dates, it is more likely, significantly more likely, that someone who's retirement eligible will retire. And those dates coming up in the future, which is why I referenced them, December of 2023, June of 2024, and then November of 2024. So those are just in our, you know, near term, but that's why we're sort of looking at those as our potential risk dates. I just wanted to share that clarification. That was helpful. I know we've almost tripled the number of non-sworn employees in fire <clears throat> since 2019-2020, and I'm gonna make an assumption, is that community health division and, and Portland Street response? Correct. Okay, and then what would be helpful for me, and we'll have to do this now, is uh, looking at the job focus of those two divisions, the community health division and Portland Street response. I just need to understand um, how their workload, how their responsibilities overlap, how they work together. Um, sometimes when you just hear what they are up to, it seems like there's some similar, um, similar responses, similar practices. Not that that's bad, but I just want to, well, no, you want to make sure you have the efficiencies that are necessary to go forward. So I just want to um, understand that a little bit more. And in one of our check-ins, you can help explain that to me as well. Perfect. You know, uh, Chief Boone or Robin, it might be helpful you, for you to give the 15 second summary of how the community health division is organized and what the three pieces do. I think that would be helpful for council. Yeah, let me just kind of walk back a little bit um, and going back to 2019, because uh, this has gone over the three years um, when it comes to Portland Street response and even uh, further uh, back uh, from then. Uh, the ultimate goal, number one, is to be a part and integrated into a larger uh, social safety network, as well as to be able to identify the appropriate responder for the types of calls that fire and police should not be going on. Uh, we have seen over the last um, 20 years uh, the, the degradation when it comes to some of our uh, safety nets. So who's the most appropriate responder uh, when it comes to mental and behavioral health issues, substance use disorder, and a network um, that really fire and police aren't plugged into? Uh, Portland Street Response fills that gap with qualified, licensed clinical social workers, uh, mental um, clinicians, peer supporters, uh, and they really do plug in with the county uh, and are the right responder when it comes to, um, you know, sending the right responder for any type of mental and behavioral health issues. Uh, they also connect um, our most vulnerable population to resources and really are plugged into the county's uh, social service network. When it comes to chat, that is something that uh, started from within Portland Fire and Rescue, uh, and it came on the medical side, even though there is a mental health component to it. We knew that the, the call volume that we were going on when it came to high utilizers, they would use the 911 system over and over and over again uh, and meet, you know, uh, have their needs met at the highest acuity level of care. That's not sustainable 
either. So we had to evolve as a fire and emergency response agency, and this came from our emergency medical side. So we started tracking high utilizers um, and then connected them through a referral service with Multnomah County Health. At the same time, what we also have found that a percentage of the high utilizers have a mental uh, and behavioral health component. And so really through Community Connect, you see the medical side of chat as well as the uh, social services side, um, mental health side of PSR working together to connect our most vulnerable population and clients with the greatest disparities to the appropriate resources. So that's an added value uh, service and initiative. But I also wanna make clear that that does not replace when it comes to any type of fire or going into a hazardous environment, just like the nursing home fire in 2021. Three of our rescues were on scene to pull people who were immobile out of nursing homes because a fire broke out in the attic in the middle of the night. So we are the foundation and the framework and our number one responsibility is fire and emergency response and technical rescue. We offer a platform through innovation to support programs that really meet the needs today of the population and the greatest disparities. Great. And I, I just want to call out the great work that the Community Health Division, starting with Robin at Portland Street Response and CHOP and Community Connect as well, have done in identifying outside financial resources to fund their programs. And so uh, while Portland Fire is generally dependent on general funds uh, across the board, uh, Community Health Division has been proactive and uh, creative in identifying outside funding sources. So I tip my hat to the work you've done and let's hope we continue it in the year to come, as well as filling some important gaps in our, in our social welfare net. Uh, Annette, did you have another comment? Yes, I do. Um, thank you. Um, Commissioner Ryan's question prompted another question from me. The general obligation bond, I mean, you mentioned every 10 years, when did this habit of going out for that bond every 10 years begin? How many times has that happened? My recollection looking through our documents is that it's happened twice and it may be beyond that, but I haven't found that documentation, which would be in the 90s. So, um, but since uh, the 2000s, it's been on the every 10 year cycle. Okay, so we've, we've done this twice. We have. Okay. Okay. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. It's kind of just a comment that, oh, you go ahead. Uh, a quick yeah. question. Can we pull up the slide that I think uh, was titled expiring one-time funds? Oh, I think we might have just passed it. Um, thanks. I know we covered this in the presentation. Um, I think it would help me to understand what are the implications for this and do we have plans? What plans do we have to either sunset these programs or find new dollars for um, these services? Or do we have plans? So I think uh, we spoke a little bit earlier when it comes to PSR. Um, a percentage is through the general fund as well as uh, one-time fundings, but there is a, a tremendous effort uh, through program manager Robin Burke that is looking at through outside funding through the CAHOOTS Act and uh, coming into compliance to receive outside Medicaid and Medicare dollars. I'll say- Can I, uh, uh, so do, uh, for especially, particularly for that program, do these dollars expire at the end of this fiscal year or do we have a little bit of runway? Uh, do we get to spend them into, how, how quickly do we have to have a solution to this uh, uh, through the CAHOOTS Act or, or whatnot? Or, um, so I'll answer that question, Commissioner. For, I think I mentioned for the, just so the CHAP program is, is set, set aside here. Um, yeah. CHAP program has grant funding and it currently runs through September of 2023, but we're, we negotiate the agreements with them sequentially. So we expect that we'll have funding in place before that expires to continue with the program as it is now. With 
Portland Street response, it is um, funded through a mix of revenue streams, including cannabis um, tax, including some general fund, and then including the American Rescue Plan funding. And I think you're specifically asking about the ARPA funding. Yeah. The ARPA funding is um, running through the end of fiscal year 23-24. So that is, that's where we need to, you know, plan for, plan to find alternative funding streams. Okay, thank you. That's basically what I was trying to get at. Thank you. Yeah, yeah just maybe it's a comment. We had a, a session last week where we looked at the Joint Office for Homeless Services, and it's just, once again, we're noticing how much of this dialogue today is about serving our homeless community. And it sounds like a high percentage of both, obviously, Portland Street response, which was expressly built, thank goodness for that, to be of service. And what, but right now there's no percentage of money coming from Metro's SHS funds towards fire and rescue. Okay. I just think it's important that we keep looking at the big system and how we fund it. Thanks. Yeah, and I, I want to flag my staff on a, a couple of items. Uh, I'm not going to take time today because I, I actually want to understand this. So uh, it sounds like you did the overtime analysis and 13 is the right number. I'd like to see the math behind that. And, and I think I understand what you did. You tried to identify the appropriate number of FTE to reach the maximum level of reduction in overtime at the minimal cost of additional personnel, but I, I'd like to see the math behind that. Um, the Portland Street response, my understanding is you're going to go for the CAHOOTS Act dollars. It seems like it's an obvious uh, and, and excellent fit, but I'm just curious to know, could, could you tell me about the timing on that? Would the CAHOOTS dollars come in time for us to be able to not support that additionally in the budget, or is there a gap there? When, when do we think the CAHOOTS dollars would be available? I'd like to turn it over to Robin Burke, who's online. Oh, hi, Robin. Hi, hello, thank you. Robin Burick, Portland Street Response Program Manager. Um, at this point, we're anticipating to become accredited by June of this year, 2023. That will open us up to pursuing the CAHOOTS Act dollars. It's still a little bit of an unknown as to what that would entail to be able to bill for Medicaid and setting up a contract with the CCO specifically to help funnel through those dollars. So um, I think it could be anywhere from six months to a year. It's really hard to tell, but my goal is to try to get that transitioned over sooner than later. Okay, thanks, Robin. And if you could just keep us keep the the chiefs all chiefs of staff to to the commissioners appraised, that would be helpful to let us know how how that's all sequenced. Can I ask a couple of just basic questions? Um, I have heard some statistics, and I want to see if they're accurate. I have heard that half the structural fires that PP uh, the Portland Fire and Rescue are responding to are in homeless camps. Is that true? I think we would need to check with our uh, Could you fire check mar on that? Uh, Carrie Schimmel on that, but I think we would also need to specify uh, what a structure fire is, right? So uh, you, there's different definitions of it, right? We usually could, consider could you, a structure fire. Could you fires. let me know how many fires there are and how many are in homeless camps? I'd be curious to know that because it's my sure. understanding it's substantial and it's multiple times a day. So basically percentage of, of uh, houseless fires within the total fire count that we Correct. respond to. Okay. Yeah, I'd like, yeah, I'd like to know because yep. it's germane to the comment that Commissioner Ryan made. Uh, I'm also told there's a significant overrepresentation of homeless individuals in terms of fire deaths in our city. Is that true? What's the time frame on that? Here's why I'm getting at this. Uh, I, I, I'm interested in what Commissioner Ryan just said. And here's the problem. Our core emergency response services are all funded predominantly with general fund resources. And now we have a major new competitor for those resources. It is our response to homelessness, which is in the large tens of millions of dollars per year, all funded through the general fund. And so now you're competing with the homeless crisis that we're all collectively 
working through here in the city of Portland. And I'm trying to figure out where the sweet spot is. Just, just as you did the math and figured out what's the right investment in personnel to reduce overtime costs, I'm doing a larger calculus, which is what is the right amount to invest in homeless remediation mm -hmm. in order to reduce the pressure on all of our general fund first responder bureaus, police, fire, the Bureau of Emergency Communications, the Bureau of Emergency Management, all of them are facing significant pressure because of the escalating homeless crisis in our city. It's an entirely, it, it, it's now one of our largest, if, if we just took our homeless investments and made it a bureau, it would be one of our largest general fund bureaus. And we've literally built it over the last few years. And all of our first response bureaus are now coming to us and saying, we're strapped. We're strapped for personnel, we're strapped for resources, we're strapped for tools, we're strapped for training. And I find that to be an unacceptable position to put the city in. I, I would say it is our core responsibility to make sure the people of the city are safe. And I'm concerned about the increasing fiscal instability that I'm seeing in fire and police in Bowick and the Bureau of Emergency Management and elsewhere in the city. So good statistics would be really helpful for me at this point. If you can go through and look at the data that you have and give me what information you know, um, I'd like to know, and I'll be very transparent. Part of my theory here around sanctioned versus unsanctioned camping is it will, sanction camps will reduce some of those costs. The, the, the encampments that the city council are supporting, we're not gonna have open fire sources for heating in those camps. That I see as an improvement, but it would be nice to know as we think about future budgets, what the potential reduction in demand for your services could potentially be as we roll that out. I need data. And the reason I need data is because there's a lot of people who don't agree with us. And the more data, in fact, that I can bring to the table, the more I can convince people that what this city is doing with regard to ameliorating the homeless crisis is the right thing. So enough of that. Uh, Mr. Any Mr. Rate, Mr. Yes, Mayor. yes, sir, Tim. Like we do have numbers in our review of the fire bureau from the fire marshal's office. I'd like to see oh, those, yeah. don't need them today, but okay. would love to see those. Thank you, appreciate it. Anything else? May Good, I, uh, yeah, please, Chief. I have one other thing too. I think it's, it's one of these things that um, where we are in this time in history and how everybody has to weigh things and you obviously know and council knows that the magnitude when it comes to the livability and houselessness and our people who are unhoused is not something sustainable on the local level. Um, what we are, when we look at investments across a public safety system or community safety on investment of camps, sanctioned camps, unsanctioned camps, it really is one of the things that there's an underlying um, disinvestment that has really harmed before you've even got here and harmed the whole public safety system. Uh, and, and that's what we're showing today. So when we talk about just a data analyst, when we say Portland Fire, the city of Portland, emergency response, largest in the state, we only have one dedicated data analyst. One, across prevention, response, uh, the analytics that you need today in order to understand how effective our, our performance is, um, what the trends are, so you can create initiatives to actually change outcomes. Across 815 and the multiple uh, response side and suppression side and prevention, one data analyst. We have added 151 additional people, one analyst. So this is where you really look at the opportunities, I'm right, yeah. You, you don't need to sell me. I mean, we, we gutted our analytical capability years and years ago, and uh, now here we are amidst the crisis, which in large measure is being driven by the homeless crisis that we're seeing on our streets, and all of that defunding of all these critical resources is now coming back to bite us, and bite us hard. And so I, I wanna work with you and work with the commissioner in charge, Commissioner Gonzalez, in this council and trying to figure out what, with a really unfortunately awful budget scenario, and it is, mm -hmm. 
uh, what can we put together and in what order that's going to make the most, most difference. But I, I also appreciate your uh, desire to be planful about it over several cycles. And, and I think that's exactly the right way to do it. So thank you for that. Colleagues, we're supposed to take a break, but would you mind if we powered through the next section and then took our break? Do, do we need a break yet? Can we go for another 35 minutes? Great. Okay, why don't we do that? Let's go to uh, the Bureau of Emergency Communications. Very closely related to what we've Very just closely discussed. related. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor, Commissioners, and Budget Committee. I'm Bob Causey, Director of the Bureau of Emergency Communications. Thank you for this opportunity to present here today, along with my colleagues. I'd also like to recognize the dedicated employees at BOEC. They step up every day to serve our community. BOEC's mission contains two key elements, effective and timely 911 call answering and dispatching help. It's pretty straightforward, 911 and dispatch. Throughout BOEC's history, that has been the primary focus of our work. We provide service for the city of Portland and all municipalities within Multnomah County. And in today's presentation, I'll be tying our mission in with our financial overview, BOEC program priorities, increases in 911 call volume, call wait times, and our five-year staffing plan to ensure adequate staffing in the future. Next slide, please. For next fiscal year, BOEC's revenue stream includes state 911 tax revenue, which makes up 16% of the budget. BOEC user and partner agencies contribute 17%, and 53% comes from the City of Portland General Fund. The remainder is primarily fund balance, with a small amount attributed to charges to outside entities, such as the Port of Portland, for shared dispatching systems. I mentioned earlier that we provide 911 and dispatch services throughout the county. BOEC receives contributions from local user jurisdictions that are listed on this slide. These users, along with public safety representatives from Portland Police and Fire, Gresham Police and Fire, Multnomah County Sheriff's Office, along with the Health Department, make up BOEC's user board. The board also includes three community representatives, one from West Portland, one from East Portland, and one from East County. Together, the User Board and Finance Committee and Budget Advisory Committee provide input and serve in an advisory capacity. Next slide, please. As you can see, the majority of BOEX costs are personnel related. And for the new fiscal year, there is a slight decrease in personnel costs due to one-time limited term positions that have not yet been filled. Next slide. And this is another way of looking at BOEC staffing, which shows most positions historically are used for dispatch and call taking. Next slide. Operations makes up about 80% of the BOEC budget. Even so, BOEC's priority investments include continued limited term funding for quality assurance analyst positions. In addition, we're focusing heavily on training new employees and currently have 42 trainees in the pipeline. We're also prioritizing continuing dispatch education, staff wellness and retention programs, and plan to implement a new data and voice logging recorder. Next, please. As you're all aware, BOEC has experienced a significant increase in 911 calls. In fact, the increase since 2018 is 39%. 911 is a barometer spotlighting the conditions in any community. And as is similar in other 911 agencies and public safety professions in general, we have been impacted by the great resignation. This has resulted in lengthy 911 wait times. The national standard for call answering states that 90% of 911 calls shall be answered in 15 seconds. And 95% of 911 calls should be answered in 20 seconds. As you can see, BOEC was within that measure a few years ago. We're trending toward a 50 second average this fiscal year. 
but some weeks are closer to 40 seconds now. 911 call answering just last week was 32 seconds. The trend <laughs> continues to improve. This slide only shows 911 calls. We also handle thousands of non-emergency calls which impact our workload and response times. The goal is to continue shifting low priority and referral calls from BOEC to the 311 program. My vision is that our community has to remember only two numbers, 911 for emergencies and 311 for everything else. Next slide, please. Retention along with 911 calls seems to have leveled off, which points to some promising news. I'd like to thank Council for approving a pilot allowing BOEC to pay double overtime in this current fiscal year. This has had an immediate impact on supplemental staffing and gaining traction for the training program. Under good conditions, training takes about 18 months from start to finish. We're beginning to see evidence that training duration is beginning to shorten. We've also had very successful recruitments and have recently hired 16 academy trainees. We are also anticipating full academies in May and in August. Currently, I mentioned earlier, we have 42 trainees in our pipeline. Next, please. This all points to a more promising future. I mentioned earlier that retention is improving and 911 calls are beginning to level off. As you can see on this slide, the dark gray area at the bottom is senior dispatchers, meaning they're fully certified in all disciplines. The yellow section is call taking certified employees, primarily consisting of trainees who are certified in call taking, but they're still in police dispatch training or fire dispatch training. Green signifies trainees who are either in the academy or in call taker training, but have no certification. Based on current projections, BOEC could have all positions filled in just over a year. And nearly all funded positions fully certified by July of 2027. This hinges on the concept of over hiring in order to build a training pipeline. This pipeline would allow BOEC to stay ahead of attrition and would be comprised of limited term positions. Next slide, please. BOEC has a fund balance that includes plans to build a training pipeline that I mentioned earlier. It also includes capital savings so BOEC is able to purchase capital items without drastically increasing fees to our partner agencies. We have a number of risks to consider. As mentioned before, 911 and dispatch training takes a long time. Staff retention, although currently improving, is still a potential risk. BOEC is facing increases in technology costs, which will likely continue to increase. And we have limited resources for major capital projects, namely a need for operations expansion and building adequate backup capabilities. We're in planning stages for facility needs. Next slide, please. BOEC requested uh, the limited term positions that are listed here to support increased workload. We have not been able to hire into these positions due to low staffing. We included these allocated funds in our new budget request to help fund the training pipeline that was mentioned earlier. Next slide. As directed in the budget note, BOEC is retaining vacancy savings to over hire trainees into limited term positions to build a training pipeline and stay ahead of anticipated attrition. We're also creating a capital savings sub fund to address technology upgrades and facility improvements. Next slide. I'd like to recap BOEC's needs for adequate staffing through continued funding and building a training pipeline. We have future capital needs, particularly regarding the BOEC main and backup facilities. Planning discussions are currently underway for that topic. 
And Boeck is also facing increases in technology costs. Even with these challenges, there is a silver lining for Boeck. We have a record number of trainees. We've had record-setting recruitments. And as a result, I mentioned earlier, have 16-person academy. We're currently backgrounding candidates for two more very full academies, one in May and one in August and we're planning a recruitment for academies in 2024. All the hard work is paying off, and we're beginning to celebrate trainee certifications almost on a weekly basis. In closing, I'd like to thank our dedicated staff of 911 dispatch and support professionals at BOEC, as well as our public safety partners within the city of Portland and across the county and thank you, Mayor, Commissioners, and Budget Advisory, Budget Committee, for allowing me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. And that completes your presentation? That is complete. Great. So follow up with the point of emphasis. Um, first of all, I do want to thank my fellow commissioners for the investment that was made last year in double overtime. I cannot understate or overstate the positive impact that's had on staffing, it's had a multiplier effect because it's allowed for greater training uh, resources, um, which keeps the pipeline of dispatchers coming in. We are truly making the city safer by this. We are seeing declining 911 wait times in 2023. Um, in some instances, every minute, every second counts. Uh, and uh, your investments in people last year is paying dividends for BOAC. So I, I just don't think we can understate uh, or overstate the, the positive impacts there. Um, for my colleagues, I'd emphasize slide 27, which really highlights the KPIs for BOAC. Uh, you have two primary variables that drive response time. That is call volume and number of dispatchers or uh, call tickers. And so those are, they're both on the slide and then you can see right there uh, the wait time. There's a third variable that's an impact is how long it takes to get through the system, but generally speaking, it's the number of call takers and volume of calls. Um, one last piece, I, I do wanna thank BOAC for thinking proactively uh, with some of our other public safety bureaus in, uh, in terms of being good stewards. One of the things we are really digging into is what we can take out of emergency into non-emergency. And that potentially includes Portland Street response. Um, you know, it, as Bob alluded to, we're looking at w whether we go full 311 or what are the alternatives for emergency calls. So this is proactive work that decreases the volume that would go through emergency potentially uh, driving positive response times without necessarily costing us a fortune. So I will leave it at that for my colleagues' questions. Uh, if I can jump in here. Uh, first, I just want to congratulate Commissioner Gonzalez and the director um, for, for this report and the trends that we see, you know, in terms of staffing and performance metrics were right on point at a time when our city and many bureaus are um, struggling to meet the moment. We actually see uh, uh, emergency communications, I think, be on um, a glide path towards uh, success and great performance. Um, so I really appreciate that uh, uh, um, and thank you for all the hard work you do. And I also want to recognize our call takers out there who are working at this very moment and we're working 12 hours ago in the middle of the night making sure that people are safe. Um, and of course I had the bureau for a little bit and it was a high honor. And um, I'll tell you, one of the place spaces where I, I uh, did not do particularly well was uh, laying the groundwork for um, uh, figuring out a plan for getting a backup center for the emergency communications and uh, um, facility. Can you tell us where we're at? Bob, can you tell us where we are with that? And I'm also curious, I know I hear some discussion um, from the budget office about maybe floating a bond uh, for some capital projects. And I was just wondering if, uh, to the degree to which you're planning for that is integrated with whatever the budget's office doing. And, uh, and I, I could have asked the same question for the fire bureau too. I know they're in desperate need of a, um, of a, a training facility and we'll need to have a bond for that, I suspect. Uh, but let's start with BOIC and then maybe I could hear from the budget office in terms of what our options here might look like. Yeah, we've had uh, some prelimin preliminary conversations with facilities. Uh, to figure out if there's existing properties that we may be able
able to use for backup, um, who we might be able to partner with. Um, we have had conversations over the, I, I've been director at BOIC for almost five years, and uh, over those five years, conversations with the Fire Bureau on partnering with a training center and using a training uh, facility as a backup uh, for, for BOEC. Um, there are uh, some technology advancements, uh, I would like to say on the horizon. It's a little bit further out there than I, I want it to be, and it has to do with an, another topic that I can dive into the weeds about, but it's called Next Generation 911. And with that uh, technology, we're probably five years out, and that would give um, the entire state the ability to have alternate 911 locations pretty much anywhere. Uh, we could uh, lease out space in a hotel ballroom, perhaps, uh, just for call taking. Um, you know, dispatch is a different animal altogether. Uh, but we're responsible for 911 as well as dispatch. So we need to look ahead and figure out what the plans are in terms of uh, our existing facility and backups. Regarding um, the existing facility, uh, you know, we have a lot of trainees in the pipeline. We have more that are gonna be onboarding. As you saw on the slide, we could be at our full complement of FTE, not fully certified, but full FTE in the existing facility. One thing that we're looking at doing is removing some offices on the operations floor so that we, for those of you who've been on there, you know there's uh, five offices along the back wall, mine's over here in the corner, ops manager's in the other corner, and we have three in the middle. And we're looking, uh, we're working with facilities to see if we can tear the walls out for those three offices to expand call taking. And by doing that, we'll be able to um, add an additional six positions. Uh, uh, thank you, Director. Uh, w one other question or just clarification, especially for folks who are less familiar with your operations. Can you just remind us why we might need a backup 911 center? Yeah, so I think uh, COVID was a, a reminder of the need for a backup. Um, we didn't use our backup facility uh, during COVID uh, because our current backup is a trailer <laughs> that is housed in city property, it's in a, it's in a garage. Um, the problem with the existing facility is it's not up to standard seismically. So if we had an earthquake, there could be a big problem with us even accessing that trailer. But during a pandemic, you don't wanna throw as many people as possible into a trailer where they're side by side um, working all together. Uh, the max capacity I believe in that trailer is 12 positions. And we have a lot more positions on our main ops floor than 12. Okay. And just one other question. Um, I remember a while back uh, out at the call taking center, there was a, a big crack in the floor or something like that. Did we ever get that fixed? Uh, it has been fixed, yeah. There was a problem with on the administrative side of the building uh, near the training room that uh, for some reason the floor started heaving and uh, facilities was aware of it came in and had uh, contractors come in and fix that issue. Uh, not exactly clear on what caused it. I was concerned that it had something to do with unstable uh, foundation. We were told uh, that uh, the, the facility is safe. It is up to code in terms of uh, seismic resiliency. Um, however, it is a little bit disconcerting when your 911 center has a big crack in the floor uh, that goes all the way into the training room. All right, thanks, Bob. Thank you. Good morning, Director Kossi. Good to see you, and congratulations on the promising trends. Yeah, thank yeah. you. I, I just want to acknowledge that it says Portland and Multnomah County. When I'm in these meetings, we talk about keeping the city safer, but when I look at all of the cities that are involved, the only one that I can tell is missing is Corbett. Is that true? Corbett's not a, a, a city uh, per se, uh, oh. but we do dispatch their <laughs> fire district. It's an it's an area, and we acknowledge them. And uh, their their fire chief is on our user board. So, well. so you take their calls. We do. All right. Yeah, all unincorporated Multnomah County. So the state, that's what they, they manage this. They manage how all 911 calls go to one um, entity within it, each it can county. Be is locally, that how? It can be locally determined. Um, yeah. However, at least in Multnomah County, all of the entities within Multnomah County uh, funnel their calls to, to BOEC. In other counties, it's different. Lane County has three 911 centers, for example. 
Okay, I didn't mean to boil the ocean on that one, but it, it, it's just fascinating that we actually take I can, in the I whole county. I can geek out for a long time about that. And when we look at the revenue that we receive from all of our partners, does I, I can only imagine what that's like to, to manage that and to make sure that when you're, they're invoiced, they know that they're getting the right amount of service. Is, is this seem to be the right number still, 16%? Yeah, it's based, right now, it's based on population. Uh, so you see- Not on calls that come in? Uh, correct, it, okay. it's population based. Uh, we are looking at, through a, a revision of our uh, IGA with the user board, uh, potentially changing that to look more at dispatched calls for service mixed with um, population or 911 calls. Okay, this is a little out there question, imagine that. Um, so when we were talking about the bond that seems to be a couple years uh, behind when it comes to fire. And then hearing in this meeting that if we had a big one, our, our call center could be um, crumbled. And that would be quite a devastation. And obviously a trailer wouldn't be a very good uh, place to go during an earthquake. So um, my, my point is, have there ever been bond campaigns that look at the bigger picture that go beyond fire and rescue that have your partners within that bond? You know, I know a couple years ago we were looking at a partnership with fire and, uh, and the focus really was uh, for the fire bureau to be able to um, build a, a new training facility and in that uh, potential, uh, the concept, and this was uh, kind of my idea, honestly, is take a training room that is uh, fully functional, that is kind of a technology learning center for anyone in the city, uh, it would be at the fire facility. It could be used as uh, a general purpose training room. It could be a technology learning center for partnership with BTS perhaps, but having BOEX technology in that facility. So if we need to vacate, then we can go to that alternate location. The technology is already there. We can just fire it up and get it going. Right. Kind of my idea. <laughs> Thank you so much. Annette has a question. Yes. Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, congratulations on improving numbers. I remember how dire things looked a year ago yeah. in the budget. So really happy to see the numbers improving and, and call second time. And on your, um, you're talking about your overhiring for training to build that pipeline. Um, very good strategy. And just first of all, just a, a comment, you know, the I've seen the presentations from um, on our demographics in regards to the largest demographic group in this in the Oregon, of course, is over 65 and the smallest are those in their 20s. We've had a decreasing birth rate that I think we're going to see this staffing challenge throughout everywhere um, as we look at a smaller workforce. But my my question around um, <clears throat> I thought the 911 center was the new building around 99th and Powell, 99th and Bush. So that isn't built to current um, seismic standards. Is that correct? No, no. The uh, the existing facility was uh, upgraded. Uh, I think about 10 years ago. So it does have um, seismic stability. I don't know if it's up to code current code for new new buildings. Um, so the existing facility has been uh, retrofitted. The um, backup facility okay. is really what's in question in that it is housed in a non-seismic garage. And um, it, you know, the trailer itself is too big for the garage. We have to deflate the tires in order to get it into the doorway. So um, it basically is just housed there and uh, is not very usable. Okay, all right, thank you for that clarification. Uh, Kevin, I want to make sure, I know you don't have your hand raised, but if, if you wanted to get in here, I just want to encourage it. Okay, no, I'm just kind of taking all that in. Um, I saw the numbers, I saw the trend, so it looks pretty uh, that we're headed in the right direction. Yep. That's good news. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, this is just a, a comment. I'm not an expert on backup 911 center technology, um, but I, I, I sure hope uh, Commissioner Gonzalez, you uh, um, show a picture to council about what that trailer looks like. Uh, I'm highly skeptical that that will be, um, that facility will be sufficient should we face a major earthquake. It just looks like a big old RV and it doesn't even look like a big RV. 
RV. Um, and you get 12 people in it. If we need it, we're going to need it because something really bad is happening. Uh, so I hope that as we think about our capital needs for the future for both fire and emergency communications, we plan for this. Um, I realize this is a tough budget uh, session, so we might not fix it this year, but uh, we certainly need to start to normalize this conversation. I want to thank Commissioner Maps not just for the comment, but also for his leadership of BOAC, because a lot of the things we're benefiting from now were things you put in place previously. Um, I do want to just acknowledge that <clears throat> with the clustering of bureaus uh, in public safety, it has created some really interesting space for thinking about facilities and long-term capital investments within public safety. We're relatively early in this, this conversation, so we've identified some specific needs inside of BOAC um, and certainly in FIRE uh, that were pre-existing. Um, there are, uh, but at this point, everything's on the table and, and looking across public safety, how we can most effectively invest um, over the long haul, uh, including uh, potentially police in that equation, including some of our um, other government partners in the region. So um, it's just, it's, it's creating an opportunity to reassess how we approach these questions. The challenge sometimes is that, you know, sometimes one bureau has a really good brand and that might be easier to float a bond. And that's the, you know, the, the trade-off. We want to think holistically. We want to um, get the most bang for our buck, but also recognizing that sometimes uh, there's a sort of a window of opportunity that may be created for one bureau or another and you're, you know, trying to figure out how to, how to sell that, you know, and, and, so to speak. So I'd leave it at that for now. All right, good. Any further questions? Excellent report. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, why don't we take a, uh, I can't actually tell exactly what time it is on the weird clock over there. Why don't we uh, take a break until uh, uh, till 40 minutes after the hour? Recording stopped. We're in recess.
All right, let's go ahead and get started. <laughs> we'll play your time and talk. <laughs> All right, next up, the Bureau of Emergency Management. Welcome. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. I uh, just want to make sure my slide presentation is sharing. Oh, it is great. Okay. You are looking at a slide of our emergency coordination center. And in the middle is a net volunteer by our, one of our vehicles and some distribution of portable AC units. My name is Shad Ahmed, the director of the Portland Bureau of Emergency Management, uh, PBEM as we call it. And I'm gonna to talk to you today a little bit about our bureau. If I can actually change the slide, that would be great. Oh, there it is. Um, so I want to talk to you about a little bit about our mission, which is about readiness, response, and resilience. And we do that through plans, programs, and policies over four phases of emergency management. And we're going to talk about that in just a second as it relates to our financial situation. But just to set the stage, we're going to talk a little bit about our workload, continuing uh, in some of the trends that you've seen here today from the other bureaus in public safety. We'll talk about what, what has changed, what has remained the same, and what that means uh, for our budget. So I, I wanna talk to you a little bit about uh, emergency management, just to give a little bit of background because it relates to the financial discussion. Uh, emergency management is really about addressing risk for the city and we do that uh, through four phases. In the preparedness phase, we are looking at hazard monitoring, and that's all hazards. So whether it's civil unrest, whether it's pandemic, whether it's uh, fire, wildfire risk, smoke, uh, zombie apocalypse, or uh, my cat not having food for the last 10 minutes. Anything that is considered a threat or a hazard, we need to monitor as a city. And then we do some pre-planning. We decide how we're going to approach those hazards that we've identified. And we coordinate across both internal and external uh, stakeholders to address those risks. And then we train and exercise uh, in order to make sure we're ready to respond and we have that capacity. And of course, there's communications, both internal and external, along the way. Uh, so this is the preparedness phase. Keep that in mind as we go through this uh, presentation. We'll come back to that. And then we have a response. And during response, we do what you might consider traditional incident response actions. We also do incident action planning because uh, while you pre-plan for anything, each hazard, each incident that materializes as a threat, we have to respond in a unique way. And we do that through some resource management, allocation and assignment of resources, acquiring resources to address and dedicate to the incident. And again, communications internally and externally. We then move into recovery, uh, that we're recovering from this event, and that's where we do a restoration of services. There might be some reconciliation, some financial recovery perhaps, and also again, we continue communications. There's another phase here that is not often uh, highlighted, but I wanna make sure we address because it's just as if, as if, just as if not uh, more important than some of the others. And in mitigation, we actually reduce the risk for the city. So we've experienced an incident, perhaps it's the pandemic, we're coming out of it. And now we need to look at how do we uh, reduce the risk if we were to experience that again. We also look at reducing risk for incidents we may not have experienced, but we could still reduce the potential impacts if we do experience it. This in and of itself is the core of emergency management. And I want to uh, just keep this cycle in the back of your minds as we go through the presentation, because we will come back to this. This is how we should be doing this as a city. And currently what we do is kind of fragmented by each bureau. So we might have one bureau that's responsible for tracking where the zombies are, and another bureau that's responsible for responding to the effects of the zombies. 
but we need to make sure that we're coordinating across those bureaus so that we are, as, as a city, one entity ready and capable to respond to that uh, threat. Um, and what that leads to is a little bit of management by, of risk and isolation, of course, and it's less than ideal circumstances. We'll come back to that. Uh, when we're talking about our resources, um, I want to highlight a couple of things on this slide. So uh, obviously we have some general fund overhead pool funded uh, services that provide support to other city bureaus. Uh, we also have intergovernmental, and this is important to note because this is, well, this is our grant funding, but one thing to note is that we have a large portion of that is covering regional uh, services. We serve as a host agency for the Regional Disaster Preparedness Organization, so a, a good chunk of that funding is actually not direct service providing to the city of Portland. It's more outside facing that we serve as a pass-through. Um, and the one uh, change I want to note also from general fund discretionary is in the last, uh, I believe it was in the fall bump, uh, there was a, a recommendation made from the uh, committee that manages the overhead pool and, and CBO concurred uh, with the assessment of moving some of our general fund discretionary, I'm sorry, uh, overhead uh, funded services for community programs into the general fund discretionary and uh, council um, made that change last time around. So we have community programs that was pulled out of there and, and into discretionary. And then we have a small amount that's interagency revenue that's actually changing a little bit. Uh, BOIC and PBEM both support a PIO that's now being consolidated with the community safety division. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about some of our one-time packages. Uh, I want to highlight that these are mostly two-year decision packages that were approved last year. So our request to carry them forward in the spring bump will mostly be a technical uh, note to carry them forward uh, for the remainder of that year. We have the Disability Equity Program where we are going to be working on some plans and training and uh, review of, uh, of our current materials to uh, support ADA compliance. Um, we have an incident management system that we are uh, working very hard right now to, uh, to implement. It's a little bit of a, a long process. It is going to be an enterprise system for the city of Portland at large. And uh, if you recall a few slides ago, we talked about that cycle and how we're fragmented. This incident management system will be a key way in how we address that fragmentation going forward. This will hopefully bring us together and integrate some of those functions that we are uh, doing as a city separately. Um, I also mentioned that last phase, if you recall, mitigation as being pretty critical because we want to uh, address the risk that we're facing as a city so that way when we go around that cycle again and we come to response, we're spending a lot of time and energy and resources on response. If we focus on mitigation a little bit more as a city, we will reduce the amount that we need to spend up on response going forward. So we wanna get out of this kind of vicious cycle that we're in, that we're continually responding. And there's a number of ways that we can do mitigation, but I will say we don't have a great uh, uh, program within PDEM to do that right now because we've not been able to focus on it uh, due to the amount of responses we've had. So this uh, decision package will help us uh, hopefully start the seed of a mitigation program for us. Uh, and also we're looking at potentially supporting some grant matches uh, as well under there. Um, I wanna call out that we are losing uh, some of our ARPA funding uh, for uh, communities, uh, uh, sorry, community organizations active in disaster, COAD. Uh, this is a program that supports community-based organizations in helping become uh, not only resilient themselves, but also to support uh, our emergency responses. Uh, this was a, council supported a, an extension last year through the end of this year, um, and we understand that there are not any more ARPA dollars to continue that program. Uh, that is pretty critical to us, so we are exploring some other um, avenues of creative funding to hopefully continue the good work that's been done there. Um, as, as you know, emergency uh, weather shelter coordination has been a, a pretty big topic and, uh, you know, Mayor, you called out that uh, response to houselessness has impacted all of our bureaus uh, and we're no different within PBAM. So uh, a significant portion of our shelter response uh, does support the houseless population. 
And council, uh, thank you again for your support. Council approved a uh, two-year decision package for one emergency uh, management coordinator to support our efforts there. Um, we were able to uh, split that into, uh, instead of a two-year, one FTE, uh, we did a little creative math, actually, thanks to uh, Ginger on our finance team, we're able to support two positions uh, going through the end of uh, uh, 624. Um, and we also have community grants that were awarded, again, through an action by council a couple of years ago. Uh, we were able to award grants to community-based organizations doing great work, uh, serving underserved populations uh, in uh, building uh, resiliency and capacity within the community. So those have been awarded this year, and some of that work is currently ongoing. This slide uh, just highlights our staff. It's remained mostly stable. We've had some limited term FTEs, again, thanks to council support. Uh, but we are, as I mentioned, uh, the COAD position is currently expiring at the end of June. Um, but we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work in front of us. And so um, um, I made the decision and council supported, I believe in the last fall bump, to uh, reprogram some EMNS funding over to a planning manager. So uh, thank you for that uh, uh, support. I think that will be a critical position for us going forward. Uh, this chart, I really like uh, this chart showing kind of like our programs. Uh, I added our FTEs on here to show where our FTEs fall. Um, I, I want to highlight that this is, even though we are supporting the community safety priority area, most of our programs also double and support many other council priorities. Everything from housing and homelessness, livability to uh, economic recovery, uh, we are engaged in activities that support uh, all of those. And you'll see on here again, Regional Disaster Preparedness Organization, again, that is the support for the regional entity that we're talking about. Uh, in talking about our key performance indicators, um, we have to be honest with ourselves. <laughs> I think some of our key performance indicators have lost a bit of meaning uh, over the last few years. Uh, when we talk about being ready, uh, resilient, and able to respond, it is hard to quantify uh, a little bit as a numerical value. Uh, so we do need to reevaluate those metrics, and we know that that's something that we're, we're engaged in. But more importantly, uh, it's important to see the timeline above, which shows you basically our emergency declarations and activations as a function of time. And as you can see, this chart, we are, we are almost in near continual emergency response. Due to climate change and a number of other uh, environmental factors that changed in the last few years, the last three years look vastly different than the three years before that. And what that means to us is that a number of our critical uh, blue sky day functions we call, we're talking about going back to that cycle I showed you, the preparedness side, which if you recall has hazard monitoring, some internal and external communications, pre-planning, and more importantly, training and exercise, are not something that we've been able to do. We focused a lot of our resources solely on the response to what you're seeing here on this slide. So uh, moving on to the five-year financial plan and, and kind of looking ahead at what we see, uh, grant funding for us is a little bit more stable than it was uh, than it is for some of the other bureaus in the city. We've been able to sustain the the kind of the grants uh, that we've been uh, receiving. Uh, through state and federal sources over time. Uh, but that, still, there is some inherent risk. We, we don't want to over-rely on that, so we try to uh, balance that out a little bit. And instead of personnel, for example, maybe we look at EMNS supporting some of those uh, through grant funds. Uh, for expenses, you're going to hear kind of the same thing that you've heard uh, through the presentations today. We have an increasing workload. We as a bureau have uh, not only engaged in a number of emergency responses, we've also been tasked to support some special events. We are doing some planning to support the city. Uh, and with that increasing workload and the same number of personnel, it's obviously, uh, you know, it's becoming more of a challenge. We also have, uh, with materials and services, increasing costs that we're facing. 
um, whether it's contracts and ongoing support, uh, we, we know that level funding for us and for as like for other bureaus means at net loss. And so we're having to find ways to, to absorb that. And as we look at expanding our mission and we're looking to support uh, other public safety bureaus and other bureaus in the city with emergency response, we may need to look down the road at what our capital needs would be, whether it's fleet or facilities uh, to be able to support other bureaus. And uh, finally, just looking ahead, um, you know, here's the bottom line. Our mission will continue to expand. The frequency with which we need to engage in that mission will continue to expand. And so we need to find ways to continue to match that expansion with resources and investment and PBAM is committed to finding any creative way that we can do that. We recognize the burden on taxpayers uh, to see you know, increases. It's not the way that we want to do business, but we do need to address this. So we want to work with council in the coming years to see what the best ways and the solutions are that we can uh, figure out what we can uh, do to address that rise. Um, and as a city, uh, we are expected to, as I said, going back to that cycle, whether it's the zombie apocalypse or any other hazard that we face, um, and, I, and I say that only partially half joking, you know, uh, we don't know what's coming around the corner, but our job is to be there to see what possibly could come around the corner. And when we don't own all of the pieces to that puzzle, we have to work with other bureaus. And so we depend, our mission depends on the partnership and integration with other bureaus, which leads into the final point on this slide. We need to establish a citywide integrated emergency management system. And that means PBEM needs to be able to support all the bureaus so that we're working together, sharing information, and we all know kind of what's coming around the corner and we're able to react as an agile organization, as a city, to be able to handle those challenges in front of us. Um, we know that that will need some investment uh, down the road, um, but actually right now the investment that we need is, is also a uh, partnership with all of, all of the bureaus in the city. And I think that we are on that path now. We have great relationships with the other bureaus uh, and we're building a capacity to support them in emergency response. Um, with that, I will uh, turn it over for questions. And thank if you. I could just add a little color commentary here as well. Um, running dialogue with, with uh, the mayor's office and the mayor's team on this. First of all, I want to say, Shad, you've done an outstanding job. Uh, it's, it's really been a new day in the Bureau of Emergency Management, and I particularly appreciate the better decision-making process with our office that didn't exist before. And so that in and of itself is, is terrific. I do also just want to say that um, we're struggling when it comes to some of the weather emergencies getting volunteers. And there has to be more emergency management at the bureau level. And I realize all the, the public safety bureaus already work collaboratively and closely with you. But I mean, all of our bureaus need to be part of the emergency management process. Uh, when it comes to getting volunteers, what has happened operationally is the mayor's office has become the de facto leader for getting volunteers to run emergency shelters. And the result of that is my team has spent sometimes days in a row working in emergency shelters. That's not their primary responsibility, nor should it be. Th this should be there should be a citywide volunteer network that is established in advance to help us get through emergency management. In other words, emergency management isn't just on you in the Bureau of Emergency Management or the mayor's office. It needs to be enterprise-wide in terms of how we think about this and how we plan. And uh, so I look forward to supporting your work uh, on that. But I, I really just want to let my colleagues know, I, I think you've done a great job, and I appreciate the focus and the planfulness that you've brought to the process. Thank you, Mayor. It's the team that's behind me that supports us that is making us successful. But you're only as good as your team. Absolutely. That's, that's to all of you working in emergency management. Thank you.
questions. Uh, looks like Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Shad. It, it, I have to echo what the mayor said. We haven't known each other long, but I've really, really um, enjoyed the conversations that we've had and, um, and your perspective and your point of view on things have, has been really refreshing. Um, and I just have a few questions about a few things that you mentioned. So I saw, can you talk a little bit about the uh, impact of the emergency weather shelter coordination team? Has that been effective? What has changed as a result of it? And I saw on that slide where you had all of the um, different emergency things that have happened over time. Um, in 1920, we had about 200, yeah. So what's, what's happening there with that data point? Yeah, so I'll, I'll just say, so the emergency uh, management coordinators that we hired just got into place in February, okay. uh, but in the short amount of time, they've done a fantastic job in really helping us mobilize and uh, streamline what we're doing in an emergency, along with our op rest of our operations team, a phenomenal job that they've done. Uh, you know, we are operating a transportation system for, uh, you know, getting folks to shelters. Um, it is, uh, I honestly was so impressed with what I walked into and what I saw with the team there. Uh, we could become uh, a real serious competitor to TriMet. It's a really professional operation. But to the mayor's point, that's not their job. You know, we really need to, to rethink and, and find other ways to, you know, achieve that mission. Um, and yeah, to this data points here, you know, we are seeing the, with climate change and everything, the more, the increase in frequency in these events is taking us away from that blue sky day job. So we have a, a person that was hired to do training and exercise, and I don't think has been able to spend a day actually doing training and exercise in, in the little over the year that, that he's been here. Um, you know, and what that means is as a city, we're losing capacity. We're losing that muscle memory that when something happens, we're able to react because of that training. And we're seeing disparities across the bureaus. Some bureaus are able to continue some training in isolation, and they're able to do that. Uh, and others aren't able to sustain that. So we really do need to address that. Okay. Thanks, and, and your answer kind of feeds into my, my last question um, where you talked about mitigation. We haven't really be, been able to um, get ahead of ourselves in order to be in that position to do mitigation well. Um, in terms of uh, where our budget is now, what do you see as like a short term some short-term opportunities around mitigation, and then what do you see as longer out, things that we could be doing? Yeah, you know, so the first step I think for us is to, we are in the process of doing an organizational assessment, and I think I'd like to let that play out to determine maybe what some of those opportunities would be in terms of mitigation. Um, but right now I can say process is one of those things that we really need to analyze in the immediate future. Uh, you know, we have a process that is integrated with the county when it comes to um, uh, sheltering that I think we are exploring with them ways to make that more efficient. I think that mitigation uh, there could, you know, help us with the response effort. But we also know as a city, uh, decision making around some of the emergencies that we've faced in the time that I've been here uh, goes through a little bit of a process and we need to make that more efficient. So. Uh, maybe not the larger picture mitigation items that you one would think of normally under the mitigation phase, but I think we need to start small there and improve some of those uh, process uh, efficiencies. Great, thank you. Go ahead, Dan. Okay, good morning, how you doing? Director Mead, it's really good to see you. Um, I don't, when you were using language about mission expansion, I don't know, for me, I don't think the mission's really changed as much as the creep is the amount of services that you're, practices that you're taking on. <clears throat> um, so I just want to put that out. And the frequency, obviously, it's like maybe you have the month of October, maybe, and maybe the month of May, where you can actually really do the study part of the Plan Do Study Act. And I hear you, you're saying that there's not, that's not built into the system of incident response, where you're meeting with your key partners at the county and such to, to do those evaluations, is that what I'm hearing? Uh, could you repeat that last part? So in a part of your continuous improvement, what I'm hearing is we, we have the big incident, we somehow get through it, there's a whole host of 
incidents within the incident that, that we're all become more familiar with. Our office has been really active in the emergency responses as well. I did utilize my check-in with the, the chair of county government to acknowledge the challenges. I now get to see it from the park's perspective. And we obviously need to improve our incidents. So when are those conversations taking place? And when I said October and um, May, it was me pretending I knew that there wouldn't be any major uh, severe weather in those two months out of the 12 months of the year. Of course, there's gonna be probably snowfall in May after I said that, but. With the zombie apocalypse then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, excellent question. Uh, so those conversations are ongoing right now, uh, working with the county. Um, it's actually something that is an ongoing cycle. So we met in actually in October of last year to start that conversation. We evaluated some options. We implemented some things that changed and improved, and we're constantly evaluating that. One thing that we introduced new this year is we have a contractor with us that's doing that independent assessment, so they're embedded with us in the response to be able to help us identify what things we can do more efficiently um, afterwards, and they're currently working on some after-action reporting as well. Um, if I could go back to your first comment, though, there is a little bit of a mission expansion, and it's actually not, um, it's just the way that we as a city have evolved. Uh, emergency management, and what I, why, how I, why I mentioned it was fragmented, is because traditional emergency management includes response to a lot of hazards and threats that PBEM wasn't necessarily a part of for that conversation. Oh. So we are now getting engaged in that. Similarly, special events is not something that in Portland we were doing before as emergency management, but nationwide, that's something that is a common practice. So we are expanding a little bit in that sense. I apologize for not clarifying that. Could you define special event? Yeah, so uh, for example, the Rose Festival is a pretty significant uh, event, obviously, that impacts the city. We are working to create incident action plans and an incident command system for running the public safety components with PBOT as well. So you heard the cats, you're the orchestrator, you're the maestro of all of these things, okay. Which is why your bureau doesn't have to have a lot of FTE if in fact you have the authority to herd the cats to get the practices aligned. Correct. And that's the goal that you're working on. Yeah. Okay. Is most of our funding that comes from outside partners, is that mostly the county? Um, the funding is uh, actually federal funding that's passed okay. through the state. Uh, to support the Regional Disaster Preparedness Organization. That supports the five counties around us. Okay, thanks for that clarification. I think that's it. Great. Uh, Mr. Mayor, if I may. Uh, thank you for the, your presentation and thank you for the important work that your bureau does. Uh, I was wondering if we could revisit your slide on revenue and expenses. Can we pull that up? Yeah. Um, uh, thank you. Um, I'm looking, I left my glasses in my office, so you'll have to bear with me a little bit. Um, can you explain to me what the yellow bars on the, um, in the bar graph mean? And also, I'm specifically interested in uh, your estimates for 2022, 20. 23, 24, how did you come up with the estimate of where that yellow, where you expect that yellow bar to land? Yeah, so the yellow bar represents materials and services, contracts, as well as internal uh, to the city, other bureaus that, that provide services for us, like technology. Uh, and the other uh, green color there is the personnel. And so this year, we have a significant amount of those expiring one-time uh, packages, decision packages from last year, and that's why you see that shift from this year into the projections for next year. We do expect in the fall bump to, I'm sorry, the spring bump to carry some of those forward. So we'll see that change, but this is specific to currently this budget development cycle uh, where we're not requesting anything additional. Okay, and can you give, give me an example of what materials and services would be? For your, for your space? Sure, so actually we have some significant contract support, as I mentioned from the after action review. Uh, we have an organizational assessment. We have um, other contracts for software systems uh, and services like that. So those are our um, external materials and services, as well as internal materials and services would be the technology fleet and uh, support that we receive from other uh, central services bureaus. Okay, thank you. 
Great, thanks. Anybody online? Kevin or Annette? Good. Thank you very much then. Appreciate the report. And Katie has saved the day. <laughs> Great, we'll move on then to Portland Fire and Police Disability and Retirement. They're not presenting today. All right, great. Is there anything else on our agenda then today? No? Uh, we have some closing comments, if I can make this slide. Shad, I'm sorry, some what? Uh, sorry, some closing comments slide great. here. Yep. You, that's on me. Uh, bear with me one second here. I just want to highlight a couple of pieces uh, and thanks, Shad, for an excellent uh, summary there. Obviously, with our core public safety bureaus uh, that are in it day to day, fire and BOAC, um, these are 365 day a year, 24 7 bureaus that are dealing with uh, Portlanders on often their worst day in their life. And that's really the story there. Um, and I, I don't think we can emphasize, emphasize enough the importance of investing in people and in uh, apparatus here. Uh, some of the metrics we alluded to earlier that, that keeps me up at night sometimes, um, a fire doubles every minute. A brain death is within four minutes without CPR. Uh, for someone suffering a serious uh, incident. So when we talk about the various metrics on this side of the public safety uh, um, structure, I just keep those things in mind. That response time saves lives uh, and materially uh, improves the quality of life for those suffering serious injuries. And intelligent investments here um, have substantial returns for our community, uh, in, in particular as in individuals and their families that are impacted. Uh, just want to also emphasize some pieces on the homeless. This and will circulate to my fellow commissioner uh, commissioners um, some of this. But 19 to 21, 23 percent of the fire deaths were in homeless communities. 23 um, percent. We're talking less than you know about 0.6 percent of the population. Um, there were over 2,500 uh, fires in unsanctioned camps during the same period. So. Uh, you're talking about close to 2,600 in the overall homeless population, but just in unsanctioned camps, uh, it's like 99.9% or 99.7% of those fires. So you are seeing substantial impacts on our public safety structure um, caused by homeless challenges, a certain extent the addiction crisis, and um, in general, some real challenges in our healthcare system. And um, we can walk you through more of that uh, at another time, but that's, that's part of the story for FIRE and for BOAC. Obviously, we've gotten some fantastic trends in BOAC. We'd like to see uh, the same thing in FIRE, and we directly attribute those trends to not only some excellent leadership and some uh, uh, hard work, but also some smart investments by you all. And um, it, uh, as we think through to the future, want to just keep that in mind. Obviously, with PBEM, um, this is the uh, plays on a different level. It's it's not just the day to day um, crisis for an individual. It is systemic crisis. It is uh, planning for the big one day in and day out, and dealing with. Uh, medium-sized emergencies with far more frequency than we used to. And so <clears throat> the, need, the needs there are a little bit different, and, um, but I think that's as much as working as a public safety system effectively, that we continue to plan effectively, uh, and also that we continue to work with our government partners uh, in really digesting what has changed in recent years. There is most certainly a homeless component uh, to what PBEM has done with, dealt with in recent years. They are spending far more time getting up uh, and dealing with cooling and warming centers than at any time in, uh, previously. Uh, those are substantial changes in their operations in recent years um, that we have to take into account as we plan for the future. 
Uh, with that, I'd just like to thank my bureaus for excellent uh, presentations today and uh, look forward to working with my colleagues on a, a, an effective public safety budget for next year. Terrific. Great presentations. Thank you, Commissioner. Thanks to all of you. We're adjourned. <laughs>